welcome to To The Point. This past week saw many local school districts resuming in-person classes for a new school year. Some require masks for younger students, those under 12 that cannot be vaccinated. Others had planned to leave it up to the parents and kids. In the case of Kent and Ottawa County, an order from their respective health departments late Friday before school began on Monday for some districts met a change in plans and all those younger students would be required to wear masks. So while some counties require masks and others don't, some districts require masks and others don't, there was a fair amount of pushback at school board and county commission meetings this last week. At least one county health department director wished out loud that the state would impose a mandate to standardize things. I asked Governor Whitmer if that was in the planning stages. Governor, do you anticipate, have you had the discussions with your health and human services director about a possible state mandate? So, um, Rick, as you know, last year we've had a lot of uh, debate over gubernatorial powers, powers that I've never wanted to use but had to use to keep people safe. We didn't have vaccines. We didn't even know that masks were going to be the most important tool that we have to keep ourselves safe until we have vaccines. We now have those. Every one of us has a tool which we can avail ourselves of except for kids who are under 12 and people who are um, compromised and unable to get vaccinated. And that's why right now it's so important that districts are adopting these policies. We have been consistent about the need for this, but in this moment we have tools that we can use. Um, we are strongly going to continue to encourage districts to do that. And at this time, there is not a conversation about a broad epidemic order, uh, but we are hopeful that more districts learn from these incredible ones that are, are leading and are doing what's necessary to keep their students safe. So it would appear that mask mandates will be left up to local school boards and health departments, at least for the time being. On the federal level, there was less talk of COVID, but there was no lack of other issues to address. We talked with Flint area Democratic Congressman Dan Kildee about the chaos in Afghanistan, the future of infrastructure and a voting rights bill that is personal for him. Congressman, we've seen in the news over the past two weeks about the drawdown in Afghanistan, and obviously thousands and thousands of people have been evacuated, perhaps that many more still waiting to leave. This obviously has been a very rough patch in trying to make this all work out. What now should the United States be doing to try to make this process smoother? Well, I think 100% of the focus has to be on, first of all, getting all Americans who want to leave Afghanistan, and we hope they all do, uh, getting them out safely. Uh, I met this morning with the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the Director of National Intelligence in a briefing to go through all these details. And the focus has to be entirely on getting the logistical support, the flight support, the, the military personnel in place. And, and I believe that's the case now, to secure uh, the area around the airport and to make sure that there's no impediment for an American to leave. And then, Naturally, we also have to focus on those Afghan nationals who stood with us, whose lives are now at risk. And that could be tens of thousands of people. So this is a logistical challenge. This is the biggest evacuation really in, in decades that the United States military, US government has been involved with. And obviously there have been, there have been some real problems, uh, but we've got to get through it. And then there will be tough questions that the administration will have to continue to answer about those early days. There's a lot going on in Washington this week, and while we could spend more time on that, I wanna move on to another big issue, that's infrastructure. Over in the Senate, they finally got a bipartisan deal for one of those packages, $1.2 trillion. There's a $3.5 trillion package that's also pending that we are told Speaker Pelosi would like to deal with in the House, even though some of your Democratic colleagues may not be on board. Where are those packages, and what would you like to see the outcome be? Well, the deal that we were able to secure today guarantees that the House will vote on the Senate passed bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I think that's really important. You know, there are things that we can do that are bipartisan. There are some things that we want to do that just can't. Uh, so if we can take the, uh, the opportunity to, to get this uh, legislation passed, the commitment now, based on the rule that we are passing today, is that we'll have that vote on the bipartisan bill before February or before uh, September 27th. Meantime, we are going to continue to work on the Build Back Better Act, which is the so-called reconciliation bill. 
that includes the budget priorities that principally Democrats want to see put in place. That's going to be tough to get 218 votes in the House and the 51 votes that we need in the Senate. It might not include everything that we all want, but you know, again, uh, this is this is where we have to compromise. It's it won't be uh, potentially as bipartisan as this infrastructure bill. It's not even clear that Republicans in the House will support even the bipartisan infrastructure bill. They're clearly not going to support the budget bill. They've made it that very clear. But we're going to have to make sure that the 218 of us can all find the same place uh, on that bill and that 51 members of the Senate. And that's tough. It, it's hard to govern, and it's especially hard to govern with really slim majorities. Yeah, and you do have a very slim, only a few votes to spare. Finally, moving on again to another subject, and this is about voting rights. I know that that is something that you have been a champion of, and there is legislation uh, that has been pending. Is there any movement on that? Yes, as a matter of fact, there's movement today on the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, we're going to pass that legislation today and send it over to the Senate. Basically what it does, is restores elements of the Voting Rights Act that were taken out in the 2013 Supreme Court decision. Uh, it, frankly, what we've done is updated the Voting Rights Act with new knowledge, new information de uh, derived from hearings that have been held so that the criticism of the Voting Rights Act, and that is that it was based upon old information, uh, can be set aside. This will be uh, an updated version of the Voting Rights Act. And essentially what it will do is ensure that any of those jurisdictions, states, counties, municipalities, that have a history of discriminatory actions uh, against people who are just trying to cast their vote. Uh, and this is mostly uh, discriminatory actions based on race. Uh, the, those sorts of actions will cause those jurisdictions to have to get pre-clearance from the Justice Department before making any changes in their voting procedures. This has been the way since 1965 that we've prevented people in jurisdictions from doing what they used to do in the South, and that is basically ensure that no African Americans can vote. We don't want to see that happen. John Lewis lived for that. He spent his life dedicated to it. We have named this bill in his honor. And as you know, John was a friend of mine. So it's not just a matter of policy. It's actually pretty personal for me as well. The future of the voting rights bill and larger infrastructure bill is uncertain and something we will continue to follow. When we come back, a complicated process gets a makeover, but that doesn't necessarily make it any easier. Redistricting, how it impacts you and why you should care. Next, to the point. Welcome back to To The Point. Every 10 years, there's a census taken to see how many people live in the country and where they live. Then, based on population, new boundaries for the U.S. House, State House, and Senate are redrawn to reflect that population. In Michigan, that has always been the job of the legislature until now. In 2018, voters approved an independent commission to do the job. I talked with a supporter and opponent of the plan to get an idea on how the process is going. First, Nancy Wang with the group Voters Not Politicians that fully supports the new commission. So if somebody said, Rick, go out and do a story about the driest subject you can come <laughs> up with, it might be about redistricting, except that is, it, it is so vitally important. And because it has a real impact on so many things in everybody's individual life, even if they don't recognize it. And I know that you, voters, not politicians, have been very interested in the idea of having uh, an independent commission draw the lines after every 10 years when we do the census, and so here we are. What was the biggest hope or the biggest purpose for wanting to get an independent commission rather than the legislature to draw those lines? Well, the legislature had gerrymandered our maps for a long time. And, and what that means is they were drawing districts to preserve their own seats and to make sure that they won their races. Um, they were essentially choosing their voters and determining the outcome of the elections before people even um, were in the polling places. So what the independent commission does is we have an, a commission of 13 Michigan citizens and their job is to listen for um, from citizens themselves, from voters about how our communities are laid out. 
Um, and they need to, the commission needs to draw districts now that preserve our, our communities and don't split them apart. Um, and essentially what's happening now is that voters get to choose their politicians, not the other way around. What is the hoped outcome? I mean, I, I understand your concerns about having the legislature do it. And certainly we've seen across the country, it hardly matters whether it was Republicans or Democrats that were in control, that there were some very strange looking districts. Still, uh, the idea that these districts are going to be symmetrical and, you know, nice and even uh, doesn't seem very likely. So what is it that you want in those districts? What makes them a better district the way the commission is presumably going to draw them? So, you know, there's a couple of things that we're really looking for forward to. Um, one is actually has to do with the process, and that's what we're seeing now. So all of the work of the commission, all of the redistricting that goes on is out in the public right now. Instead of with, with the legislature, it was all done behind closed doors. Nobody knew uh, what they were doing until the maps came out. And then we realized, of course, that these districts don't really follow any sort of you know community lines or anything. They actually split a lot of communities apart. Um, again, because uh, politicians needed to make sure that, you know, they had safe districts and that they would win no matter what. Um, now, what we want to see is we want to see commission, the commission respect communities. So what we're having is voters coming in and giving their input. They're submitting maps. They're talking to the commission and they're saying, hey, it makes more sense for you to, you know, connect this neighborhood with this uh, neighborhood because we share, let's say, an economic center or the same, you know, environmental concerns. And so the maps, we're not saying like they should look any particular way, but that when you see them, it'll make sense to Michiganders that, oh yes, of course, that you would want to keep this set of people in the same district so they have representation. With the rules such as they are, and without getting too far into it, uh, you have to have equally based districts based on population. There are federal rules that, that deal with other parts of the population that have to be represented. So, I mean, there are a lot of different rules in there that are somewhat, I, I wouldn't call them constraints, but they make drawing those maps more difficult. It's not like you can just say, oh, this makes sense because this is a like-minded area or they have, uh, as you talked about, they have similar interests um, from an economic standpoint or whatever it is, but it's also got to be numeric, how much more difficult does that make it? Well, there are a set of constraints and actually that that should make people uh, more reassured. Um, and these constraints kind of, they exist no matter who is drawing the line. So they have to have equal population, like you said. But what's different about Michigan's new amendment that voters approved is now communities of interest are high up on the list. They come higher than, you know, county preserving county lines, for example, or, you know, something called compactness where you're trying to get the, you know, the, the smallest shapes possible. Um, and so what that means is, you know, communities must be kept intact, um, you know, before the, the commission looks to do other things. And but what, what we need for, you know, the commission to know where our communities are is you need people to come in, like I said, and, you know, and testify before the commission and, and draw their maps and submit them, you know, and that submission, those, you know, that input doesn't have to be technical. It doesn't have to, you know, there's no formula that people have to follow. It's just a matter of really coming in and say, hey, you know, our district, we need a representative that represents, you know, this part of our town and this part of our town and keeps it together. It can be as simple as that. Um, and then with that, the commission can follow its rules, which is like, again, to, to respect our communities and keep them together. It's, it's no fault of the process if people don't show up and participate, but are we really getting input from people about just the things you're talking about? Well, I know we know that 61% of all Michiganders who voted in 2018 voted for this amendment. And that's, you know, you're talking about gerrymandering, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of really technical, it's kind of dry. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is people are really understanding because we're feeling the effects, right? Our, our government is not working for us. Our politicians don't listen to us. So we were really feeling as voters, the effects of gerrymandering. Um, but voters then came out in force to approve this amendment and to approve this commission to do what it's doing now, which is draw lines out in the open for everyone to see and for everyone to have input. And that is a different kind of democracy um, that really, you know, restores the faith of a lot of people that government is what it's supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be of our, of the people. It's supposed to, um, you're supposed to have a, a commission that really listens to people and incorporates our input uh, in real time. 
So, you know, we are right in the middle of the process. Um, that is one of our challenges as voters, not politicians and other groups like legal women voters. We're trying to get the word out. And so is the commission, you know, they're putting out mailers now they're, you know, we're, we're putting out um, ads and, you know, talking to as many people as we can to say, hey, now is the time. The commission just started drawing maps and now is the time that we really need to participate. And what you're seeing is the trend is going up, which is great. So we're hitting our milestones. You know, you said, you know, there's not a ton of people that have uh, participated up to date, but we're really hitting our milestones. And you're seeing that um, the public participation is, is trending upwards with every single week. And that's what we want to see. Tony Daunt with a group called Fair Map says he has a lot of questions about the process. Let's start with the idea that you have 13 individuals who have been working through pretty extraordinary conditions uh, through a pandemic and delayed census numbers, et cetera, a number of different things, trying to draw lines for 110 House seats, uh, for 38 Senate seats, and for what will be 13 congressional seats, and they've never done this before. When you and I talked uh, previously, uh, I didn't know exactly how to define your position on this independent commission. The word you used was skeptical. Um, tell me what your, your overall view of the independent commission is and what, if any, concerns you have about it. Sure. And, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to come on here. And, uh, you know, in, it's no secret that I've, I've been um, a skeptic and, and opposed, uh, you know, in 2018, I worked hard to try and defeat this proposal on the ballot. But, uh, you know, it is, it, it, the voters approved it and it is uh, law of the land and it's something we should uh, you know, be ready to work with. And that's, that's what I'm doing. I am still skeptical, though, because it is 13 folks who have never done anything like this. Uh, it's an incredibly complex and complicated process. And uh, you throw in those, those issues that you mentioned, the, the pandemic and different census delays and everything that came with it. And it's made the, the task even more difficult. And unfortunately, what we've seen from this commission over the last month or two in particular is uh, kind of hunting for excuses not to get to work and get maps drawn. They finally started doing that. And I think what you're seeing with some of these maps they're putting forward right now is, you know, they're, they still haven't let us know what their, their key priority is in terms of this supposed communities of interest. And I think it's going to be difficult to judge their product without knowing what their priorities are when they start. What are the most important things in drawing these district lines? Well, you know, obviously there's, there's you know, the couple of uh, federal um, issues, the Voting Rights Act and equal population, um, you know, that, that is something that they, they simply can't ignore. Um, the, the other is, you know, when you talk to people throughout the state, whether they be Republican, Democrat or independent, um, you mentioned the idea of protecting the existing municipal boundaries. So, you know, city lines, township lines, county lines. It's, it's intuitive to people that, yes, that's a community of interest. It's, it's the community where I live. Um, it makes sense to protect those. And I, I think that should be first and foremost um, what they focus on. Um, and what we're seeing with some of the things they put out uh, over the last couple of days is they're not prioritizing that nearly as much as they should. You know, for instance, one of the draft maps they put out yesterday um, separates Lansing from East Lansing in the state Senate. Now, those two areas, they share a name. Um, Lansing is in, in both of their names. It seems to me that that's a community of interest. And certainly East Lansing has much more in common with the city of Lansing than, uh, you know, the, air, the rural areas of Shiawassee County and Clinton County that they put East Lansing in with for a state Senate district. And so it's those things that just really don't seem to make a ton of sense with um, with where they're going with some of these maps. When you look at the maps that have been drawn over the past few census, um, you could pick them up and say, well, this doesn't make any sense either, right? I mean, uh, I look at one Senate district that changed and was drawn up into Kent County that had never involved Kent County before. Um, so drawing lines almost necessarily means there are going to be things that don't make sense because of the population requirement. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, you have to draw, as you said uh, at the outset, there's 110 state house, 38 state Senate, and now 13 congressional. You have to draw a line somewhere and the puzzle pieces have to fit and they have to meet certain requirements. Uh, related to population and, and, and those items that we've mentioned previously. And so, yeah, that, you know, it, generally it's a gerrymander if you're not happy with it is, is how it kind of turns out. Um, 
But when VNP um, pushed this proposal um, in 2018 and, and got it on the ballot and, and supported um, VNP being voters, not politicians, the group that was behind the effort, they made a big deal out of the way districts look. And they used, in, uh, for instance, the 14th congressional district in down in Southeast Michigan that starts in Detroit and kind of snakes its way uh, to the West and then up into uh, Pontiac. That was done very much so for the Voting Rights Act and to make sure that there were enough minority voters within that to meet those requirements. Um, and now what you have are people kind of trying to flip the script on that and say, well, you know, how districts look isn't necessarily as important um, as communities of interest. And so in my mind, in the mind of many I talk to, you can't have it both ways. You can't point out the way districts look and some of the foolishness of them to pass this and then turn around and say, okay, now that we've got it here in our constitution, don't really worry about what they look like. Uh, I think you gotta be consistent. When the maps are ultimately drawn, do you have a sense to what, the, for example, the congressional districts will look like? Because those districts are so big, and you talk about having communities of interest, they necessarily are gonna cover multiple communities, and uh, even more so now, given that we're going to lose yet again uh, another member of Congress. Uh, do you have a sense of what you think those should look like? I, I think, um, you know, like we just talked about there, you got to draw a line somewhere. And so, um, you know, I think uh, if this commission wants to focus on partisan fairness, for instance, um, where, you know, the maps aren't skewed one way or the other for either party, there's a number of ways you can do that. Um, congressional, for instance, you know, I think it makes the most sense uh, to start at the UP, uh, you know, start the Keweenaw Peninsula and you move down through the UP, through the Upper Peninsula until you hit that population number and then you build from there. Um, you know, that's one of the things that doesn't make sense about what this commission's, how they started. You know, they're kind of starting in the middle of the state. It's like, you know, starting uh, a puzzle that you're putting together with trying to find the pieces in the middle. Generally, everybody starts with the pieces around the perimeter. So you've got a border and you work your way that way. Um, you, know, you can only do so much with the Upper Peninsula. It's, it's, you know, now that we've lost a seat, it's going to be even, the first district's going to be even larger. And so I think it makes sense to start at those kind of border areas, whether it be the UP or down in the corner of the state in Monroe or Southwest Michigan and kind of work your way up or down in a certain direction. Because um, you do things in the middle, you're going to, you're going to end up running out of population. You're going to have to move lines, you know, cascade movement of lines as opposed to uh, doing it kind of one at a time. One of the difficulties facing the commission, and for that matter, other commissions and legislatures around the country, is that census numbers have been delayed. They're only now getting to the people drawing the lines, and the delay in numbers could well delay the new maps getting approved, meaning that those people running for office will have less time to know exactly what district they live in and what area they might represent. It's a process that we will follow, and I will have more on later this week on News 8. When we come back, a final thought to the point. With many schools already beginning the new school year and others to follow in the coming weeks, we are sure to hear more about concerns regarding COVID, mask wearing, and exactly who should be making those decisions, and people on both sides with strong opinions. From practically the beginning of the pandemic, we have seen division based on personal beliefs and, yes, political beliefs as well. Nearly 18 months into this pandemic, those differences were on full display this past week. From COVID to infrastructure, education, to the latest developments in Washington and Lansing, I hope you'll join us here every week to The Point.